morning. I'm uh, Laura Grigori from Iria and Sorbonne University, and, and I am the former chair of Scientific Steering Committee of PRAISE. And I'm glad to introduce today George Karniadakis. Uh, George he is a currently a professor of applied mathematics and engineering at Brown University, and uh, he got his PhD in 87 from MIT. He has received many accolades. He is a SIAM fellow, uh, class of 2010. He is a fellow of American Physical Society, 2003. Uh, he got many prizes, and recently he got the SIAM Computational Science and Engineering and ACM Prize in 2021. And his current research interest is on machine learning for scientific computing. Unfortunately, he was not able to travel to Paris, so we, we will watch his uh, recorded talk. And with this, we, we can start the talk. Thank you for the invitation uh, today, and I would like to talk about physics informed neural network and how we can scale them to large scale applications. Uh, as an example, we start with uh, uh, this uh, black and white picture, it's a video that shows the um, a contrasting agent uh, dye visualization in a, uh, a brain artery um, with an aneurysm. This dilation that you see uh, of the artery is an aneurysm. That's, of course, an undesirable the disease state. So I uh, would like to understand it. And what the neurosurgeon, for example, would see is a realistic picture of uh, of uh, what you see here, and in fact, this uh, was taken at uh, Children's Hospital um, in in Boston. Um, so a few years ago, we um, talking about uh, supercomputing. We um, attempted to simulate uh, aneurysms, as you can see here in this picture, uh, and uh, we were part of the uh, Gordon Bell uh, uh, competition uh, at, uh, about uh, ten years. Uh, more than 10 years ago. So what you can see here, we, do, we did a multi-scale simulation where we have the uh, whole brain vasculature at the same time we were focusing on the apex of the aneurysm where the rupture could happen. And now this was a very expensive computation, 300,000 cores. It took us uh, a lot of time to complete the details. The methodology was complex. But at the end, we actually learned very little. Uh, although this was a real geometry, we learned very little about um, the process of uh, rupture. Um, so, so again, the, what the neurosurgeon sees is some real data, black and white. What we multi-scale simulations could give you is a lot of possibly insights. However, that's, uh, it's, it's not something that can be done routinely. And this is where neural networks uh, uh, would come in. Uh, so uh, more broadly, uh, what we have is uh, is a combination of uh, physical laws, uh, just like the uh, describing the blood flow uh, in the and the and the solid mechanics and the mechanics of the t biomechanics of the tissue, uh, but we also need data, real data that could be in the form, for example, of visualization. The question: How can we combine those two? In the in the standard scenario that I show you, uh, we had a lot of physics. We pretend we knew all the physics, and we had very little data, just the boundary conditions and the geometry. Uh, most, in most uh, realistic situations, we, uh, in complex systems, multi-physics systems, we know part of the physics. Not, uh, for example, in reactive transport, we never know, know the um, reactions. But we, all have, uh, uh, we also have some uh, data. And this is the case that I want to cover today, how we can combine data and physical laws using this uh, physics on neural network. Um, the paper that we wrote to first appeared in 2017, and since then has been uh, adapted um, in many different communities, uh, from our medicine to engineering, even astrophysics. Uh, it was also adopted by um, the industry. Here you see in the 2019 Supercomputing Conference, uh, Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, advocating. He gave a like, 15 minutes talk about uh, AI for, uh, for, for science. In particular, he's talking about uh, physics-informed neural networks. In fact, uh, my postdoc, uh, Mazia Raisi, worked with them, and now NVIDIA has a whole division working on, on uh, this topic. Um, so what is a physics-informed neural network? Well, it is a composite neural network. As you can see here on the left, we have a standard uh, data neural network that will correspond to the blue term in the loss functions in the bottom, while on the right, we have um, a, a sort of a continuation, or if you like, an extension of this uh, uh, neural network 
in the same parameter space theta, uh, which will be used to um, uh, enforce the physics. For example, we're looking here at the advection diffusion equation, and that conveniently will be done using automatic differentiation which is the same technology that we use to backpropagate errors in neural networks. So we don't need um, grids, we don't need uh, any complicated meshes, uh, and so therefore the implementation using automatic differentiation of enforcing any type of PDEs or boundary conditions is, uh, is very simple. In fact, this, this code that uh, uh, we have now with pins is of the order of hundreds of lines, not thousands of lines. Let me... Um, <coughs> give you an example of how this uh, is implemented. So let's start with this uh, Berger's equation on the on the uh, top left. Uh, so so I also show you a piece of code here, a TensorFlow, where we can see that with a, uh, a simple command we can define the left hand side. The left hand side corresponds, of course, to the data mismatch, which is on the bottom, is the uh, left term um, for the least square difference. Now, we also need to take in, into account the physics that is done by automatic differentiation, TF gradients, in time and in space, two derivatives. Where's the data? Well, the data in this particular case for the Berger's equation uh, is uh, the, the initial conditions that you can see here, t equals zero on the upper right. And then there's also these boundary conditions, for example, at the x equals minus one and x equals one. However, you can see that there are gaps in the boundary conditions. So this problem, although simple, cannot be handled with standard solvers because we have gappy boundary conditions and, and of course this is an ill posed problem. However, because of the different type of optimization we pursue here, so that will be the second in the loss function that will be the minimization of the residual on the right, uh, this is no problem here and we can get 10 minutes later uh, from where we start, we can get pretty good solutions of uh, very steep dynamics um, as is shown here uh, that uh, at, at times equals 0.5 there's a a, a shock, of course, is formed in, in the um, case of, uh, of zero viscosity. So this is not trivial to do. Uh, however, this is done in, in really 10 minutes. So that's the simplicity is one of the great advantages of uh, pins. Uh, let me go back to that um, problem that I um, showed you in the beginning, and I will talk about hidden fluid mechanics. That is a um, uh, some work that we published a few years ago, a couple of years ago in um, in science, and uh, at the time I challenged my postdocs to um, um, uh, discover if we can uh, actually compute the primary variables, that is uh, velocity and pressure, given only flow visualization. So what you see here on the, on the top is um, flow around an object, a cylinder, and what we observe is simply a video in this cutout, uh, the flower cutout, uh, of a passive scalar. Now, this is of course a qualitative uh, a picture. The question is, can you obtain quantitative results like the velocity magnitude, uh, the velocity vector there, as well as the pressure, which is of primary interest. So uh, in order to do that, now we have to encode this, um, uh, what we think are um, the equations of motions, uh, for example, here the Navier-Stokes, the compression Navier-Stokes, but we also add the passive scalar equation on the top which of course is the data, describe the data. By matching the data, uh, and, and again, we use the automatic differentiation to implement uh, all these equations, we can see that we can uh, then obtain here on the second row and on the third row, we can obtain the velocity and the pressure field. Uh, similarly, in the um, starting with the aneurysm that uh, I described earlier, uh, it would be very almost impossible uh, with other methods other than pins to obtain quantitative information uh, extracted from just this uh, black and white video that the neurosurgeon uh, uh, would see. Uh, however, here what we do is we encode this uh, video into this equation, which looks like an advection equation, for example, with the imaging. And then we couple that to models, for example, the um, non-Newtonian uh, Navier-Stokes equations uh, for fluid flow. In fact, we don't have to do this for the entire uh, artery, we just need to, we can concentrate on uh, on the um, uh, aneurysmal sac, which is of, of course of interest, and, 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 and the goal here is to extract the uh, stresses on the aneurysmal sac, on the, on the tissue, uh, to uh, examine where to investigate uh, or to predict when this uh, aneurysm is, uh, will rupture. Uh, so by uh, here we see how we can 
I show you the video. Uh, that's, uh, that's our data now. And, and hidden fluid mechanics here I mean, means that we can extract the velocity and the pressure just using the video only. And I have a, another video to show you here that uh, with verification with um, um, CFD, you can see that we can actually learn this velocity field um, uh, very accurately just using uh, 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 this uh, visualization. Okay, so we've seen some of the capabilities of, uh, of pins. I don't have time to talk about all these other applications, but pins are agnostic to the specific uh, PD that we are solving. Um, uh, since I want to focus here on scalability and cost, uh, we profile here the um, uh, Bergis equation that I showed you earlier uh, for uh, as a function of the residual point. The residual point is uh, the point where we compute uh, uh, we try to enforce the physics, uh, random points in the space-time domain. We never discretize space or time. These are continuous uh, variables. And you can see there's a linear increase with the number of, uh, of residual points of the cost. Similarly, with the number of layers, the deeper we go, we see a linear increase with the cost. And similarly, with the number of neurons uh, for a fixed uh, architecture. Now, the important thing to notice here is that the main, the main expense, the main computational expense, is due to the residual, computing the residual loss, namely the physics, as um, because the data mismatch and the backwards, uh, the backward, uh, back propagation take uh, much less time. But, and that comes uh, directly from the automatic differentiation, which is, of course, an operation that is done on graphs, and that is, um, has linear complexity, as uh, is indicated here uh, in the bottom. So the main point with this slide is that um, we have a heavy compute kernel, and therefore we can, uh, uh, as, as we, we can uh, scale it up uh, uh, using parallel compute. Now, uh, there are different models on how we can do that. Uh, we know from, uh, from uh, uh, commercial machine learning that there's uh, both data parallel and, and model parallel uh, uh, paradigms. And here I show you here, we will uh, basically work with the one on the left where we, we uh, start with the data and then break up the data uh, and assign it to different uh, D1, D2, D3, D4, let's say four, and then we assign to correspondingly to four different GPUs. Now for each one of these GPUs, we have to compute a loss function, which is denoted here by J1, J2, J3, and J4. However, before we update our weights, we have to um, uh, do an averaging, we have to, to so that, so that uh, uh, it's uh, be because all these weights are the same for each one of these. It's the basically the same model, the same neural network model operating across all different uh, GPUs. So we have to uh, synchronize them. Therefore, we have to uh, average the, the, all the lo losses together. So in the update of the weights and the bias here, um, uh, we have to communicate. And that's why the old reducer expensive operation would come in. Uh, the Model parallel is somewhat different in that uh, we can use batching and then uh, uh, each layer of the neural network or a bunch of layers could be assigned to different GPUs. And because this is a sequential process, we have to use with batches. So, so the, f the first batch would uh, work on uh, layer one and then that uh, the outcome of that would go to layer two uh, while I would bring in the batch two and so on. And the same thing for the backward pass. So here the bottleneck is uh, slightly different, but as I said today, I will concentrate more on um, for comparisons of the data parallel. However, for PDEs, there is another paradigm which uh, seems to be uh, uh, more advantageous, and that is um, we can actually divide, use domain decomposition, and we can divide the space-time domain of the PDE into subdomains, and in each subdomain we can apply uh, the PIN principle. Uh, this is shown here um, uh, schematically on uh, on the top, and then we have to modify the loss functions on the bottom, where now we have to stitch all these domain, domains together using um, uh, inter the interface uh, loss. Uh, just as an example, um, I have this uh, Bergius equation that I showed you earlier. Uh, we can subdivide in two arbitrary domains, for example, the blue sea and the dolphin. Now, the blue sea will be uh, assigned to uh, GPU2, the Dolphin, which has the more complicated dynamics, will be assigned to um, uh, GPU1. And you can see here the advantages that we now we have two different neural network models. 
In other words, the physics will dictate what neural network model will use where. In the space-time domain, they are horizontal in the time and vertically in the space. Now, I'll talk about <coughs> the details in a second, but as you can see here, the solution, uh, if, you, if we stitch it properly, the two subdomains together, uh, we can basically half the time, because we can do this in parallel, well, at the same time, produce similar solutions, correct solutions, as uh, is shown here on the bottom right. We have also developed theoretical work and a priori and a posteriori estimates that will tell us when to use X-pins versus pins, but that's a different discussion. I will not um, elaborate on that. Uh, here I have the references. So in summary, dom domain decomposition-based um, pins uh, offer several advantages. For example, the parallelization capacity. Uh, and so we have multiple GPU model, GPU, multiple GPUs and corresponding uh, neural networks models, which we can tune. Therefore, the representation capacity is much bigger, and uh, the ability to um, uh, tune those hyperparameters for each domain, depending on on the physics, is different. And of course, that is um, uh, the great advantage. Uh, in addition, by looking at uh, values, for example, of the residual and try to minimize the residual or uniformize the error in the residual, we can uh, refine, uh, just like we do in finite elements, where we do a posteriori uh, error refinement. Moving on, uh, I want to explain now how we stitch those domains together, and that will depend on the PD. For example, uh, for a class of PDs, which we refer to as conservation laws, for example, in fluid mechanics, in solid mechanics, and so on, uh, we can um, uh, introduce uh, a concept similar to discontinuous galactic methods or finite volume methods, where we're trying to match the fluxes uh, for each subdomain. Uh, of course, we want continuity of the state, but also we want the fluxes for conservativity. Uh, so, that, so in other words, here we have to add this red term. And in this schematic, we have to add this uh, another uh, layer, the interface layer, and all uh, letters here in red signify the communication cost that uh, that we now have to uh, add to the uh, purely computational uh, cost of pins. Uh, how exactly is that done? Here I have a, a, um, a conservation law in, in, in this form. Um, uh, so, so there's, uh, uh, we impose first a flux continuity, as I said, just like in finite volumes. And in addition, we, we may want to impose, we want to impose the solution continuity. Um, and of course, if the solution is zero, we can do like that, but we have also cases where you have shocks and discontinuities. In that case, um, we basically make, make the average state, the reference state, right at the interface. Uh, in addition, another, of course, this we call that C pins. However, these are not very general, uh, so we cannot extend it to any PDs. Instead, we have developed another method. So instead of working directly for the stitching, that is, different domains together, instead of working directly with the fluxes, what we have here is uh, uh, we can work with uh, the residuals. We know that the residual has to be zero everywhere, so therefore uh, it has to be also zero at the uh, interface, so it's a continuous quantity, and therefore we can penalize it, as you can see here, to minimize the difference from one domain and the and, uh, outside the domain and inside the domain. So penalizing uh, the difference in the residual is the stitching condition. In addition, we can uh, impose, as before, um, the uh, uh, average solution continuity. Now, the advantages here is that we, this uh, extended, the X-pin, can be uh, applied to any differential equation, uh, and can also do, we can also do parallelization in time, which is, uh, as you know, there are not many methods that can uh, uh, do parallel in time, PDs uh, parallel in time. Parallel is the one algorithm, but uh, it's, uh, it's very fragile. Okay, so uh, uh, just a quick example to show that we can work with uh, uh, non-convex domains, arbitrary domains. Here we are solving the Poisson equation in 2D, and we have three different domains. Uh, those three domains are these uh, two cutouts, and then the uh, hollow domain, the uh, non-convex hollow domain, will be the third, dom the third one. And just for illustration purposes here, we uh, assign three different uh, neural networks uh, on three different GPUs. So that's the big, exp uh, the big capability now that we can actually have, as I said, different neural networks for each part of the domain as the multiphysics uh, would determine it, suggest. Uh, so just so that we um, compare the C pin 
the algorithm for the conservative loss, for the conservative loss versus the extended pin for arbitrary pins. Uh, the uh, blue part is basically the same, just as I said with the data loss and the loss on the um, and, and the penalization of the physics, what we call the residual loss. But then we have this uh, flux loss, which that would be for the C pin L F lowercase f, where capital F would be the residual continuity across the interfaces, which I just described. Uh, and uh, and um, so, so uh, um, and, and of course there's a, uh, a computational a communication cost associated with that, and that is why I put this uh, in red for the parallel communication. Uh, so here now you may recall with the data parallel problem we had this all reduce operation which is expensive. Expensive here, as I said, we have different neural networks and we have different models on each GPU. However, we need to. Um, uh, and and we, we, we can involve point-to-point, -point, not, not collective communications, but point-to-point -point communications, which are cheaper to pass the uh, information from one domain to the other to deal with the continuity of the residual, for example, in the X-pin case. Uh, similarly for the C-pin case where we try to match the, the fluxes. However, we, uh, after we, we do that, then each one of these is, uh, is really parallel, uh, and we can see in some of the results how this... Uh, uh, this uh, new paradigm that we have introduced for, for multi-GPUs uh, uh, behaves. Uh, just a simple, uh, let's start with this uh, 2D standard CFD equation where we looking at, the, let's say, a cavity flow. Let's say in, in steady, in steady se state, so we take the partition of the domain. What you see here are the triangles at the residual points where we enforce the physics, the random points inside this. Uh, and in each one of these squares will have a pin. And then we have data points, which here will be just the boundary conditions. And then interface points, of course, will be these um, uh, square uh, uh, symbols right at the interface. So we could have uh, here, in a, uh, this would be assigned to a, a GPU, for example, and we have four sides communicating, or we can have a boundary uh, element here where we only have communications in, um, in, uh, in, two, in two phases. Uh, so, you get, so, so, so you get the idea. Uh, in terms of accuracy, both C-pin and X-pin give solutions which are um, uh, uh, agree with the standard benchmarks in the literature for range sum 100, 400, and so on. This is a standard CFD problem that we teach in our classes to our students. So, so passing this uh, accuracy test, now we ask uh, uh, what is the scalability. And as you can see here, in, uh, and we have scalability both for the X-pin on the left and the C-pin on the right. Uh, we plot the samples per second versus the number of GPUs. We can see that uh, up to 25 GPUs that we use here, uh, we have almost perfect uh, scalability. Uh, for C-pin, uh, the scalability is not perfect, but it's, pre it's very high efficiency and speed up as well. Uh, uh, but uh, as you can see here from the number of uh, samples that we do per, se per second, uh, C-pin is actually um, computationally uh, more favorable. Uh, faster, and, and uh, that uh, would be seen also in the strong scaling. So moving on to the strong scaling, and first we look at the uh, at, uh, CPUs here. Uh, so you can see, um, for example, that as we uh, the speed up, uh, as we increase the number of, uh, of CPUs uh, uh, here, uh, um, we see that uh, there is um, um, pretty good uh, speed up, and, and that shown here in the efficiency that we can get up to 25%, uh, 25 uh, nodes, we can have uh, uh, more than um, uh, close to 80%, 80% efficiency for, for C-pin and then for X-pin uh, a little lower. The reason we have with X-pin a little lower efficiency is because we have to compute to compute the residuals which have higher order derivatives and that uh, complicates um, uh, things. I will um, next try to show you a, a, a problem that uh, XPIN can do a very complicated problem in, in some sense because we have a arbitrary domain like a United States uh, uh, map and we break it up into regions which are sort of, we divide them using the, uh, the Northeast, the Midwest and so on. There are 10 different domains and these 10 different domains we assign uh, different uh, um, neural networks. Notice that the number of residual points where we enforce the physics namely this equation is different as well as the adaptive activation. Uh, we can use adaptive activation functions, a concept that we have introduced in, in neural networks 
uh, which could be different in every different domain. Now, the problem that we're trying to solve here is given the, some measurements of temperature, we're trying to infer, it's an inverse problem, we try to infer these conductivities, which are uh, uh, fields. There are non-conductivities uh, using this, um, uh, some sporadic measurements of temperature along with the uh, boundary conditions, the initial conditions. Uh, and the results are shown, shown here. They have the temperature and the conductivity, and uh, the errors are less than 1% uh, both in, so in, we infer, in fact, both the, the temperature field, uh, the remaining, so we just have sporadic measurements, as well as the conductivity everywhere. And in both cases, the error is less than 1%. And that is done uh, basically 10 times faster uh, than what we do in, in a single, uh, on a single GPU. Uh, so, so both the task, the type of task, this hybrid problems where we, we know some of the data uh, on the temperature and we know some of the models, but we don't know, for example, the conductivity of the field, that can be done in one shot, uh, as, you can, uh, as you could see here, and done very fast using um, 10 GPUs instead of one uh, GPU. Um, in terms of the scaling, uh, I, I show you results for, for CPUs versus GPUs. Uh, we have here a comparison. You can see here on the left, we have the CPUs and, and GPUs. In fact, for um, uh, different float arithmetic and uh, 64 arithmetic will give you a, a bigger speed up, uh, in fact, uh, ten, a speed up of 10 on, on CPUs, and the speed up becomes uh, nine on, uh, on GPUs. Uh, the exact numbers will depend if you're a, a flow, two, flow 32 or flow uh, 64. Um, uh, so, so that's very important. Uh, as you can see, the difference in the GPU between float 32 and 64 is not as big as it is on the... On the. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, X-pin, unlike uh, C-pin, uh, we can have a parallel in time partitioning, and you can, that you can see here. Uh, on the left, we have the C-pin. Uh, time is for the horizontal axis, uh, space in the, in the vertical axis. So we are able to partition time, as you can see, so we can have eight domains, for example. Therefore, I can compute this on eight GPUs compared to a C-pin on the left. And if you look at the time here, the C-pin time is 0.14, but, we, but we, the X-pin overall is much faster. We take per time step, we can see uh, per iteration, we take 0.06 seconds, which is uh, less than half, in fact, using the time parallelism. And that's a new thing that I, like you to, to remember from this um, uh, little exercise for the 1D Berger segment. Uh, and the last part I want to talk about is how we solve uh, large scale problems and, uh, and uh, I will focus on, on the large energy simulation. You know, uh, in, instead of trying to uh, do a, a forward simulation here, um, and, and that's one of the big uh, holy grail, sim in the holy grail is in the large energy simulation, what is the model for the subgrid stresses? So there are, existing literature models like the Smagorisi classical model with corrections, which has to do with the Van Dries dumping. Uh, so the viscosity will go, the eddy viscosity will go to zero as we go closer to the wall. But here we assume that, uh, uh, and, uh, the, that this, this model is incomplete. So we have, in, in fact, incorrect as we go, as we approach the wall. So we want to discover, and that's sort of the inverse problem, we want to discover using DNS data, what would be the corresponding subgrid contribution uh, uh, from the stresses. Uh, so, so we want to, the goal here is to compute this correction factor delta, which is a function of y, the distance from the wall uh, to the, let's say, the center line of uh, in, a, in a channel of turbulent flow. Um, in this case, now we have a pin, which is shown here schematically on the top, but we also have a, an extra neural, extra neural network that would represent implicitly this function delta of y, which is the correction to the subgrid stresses. And um, uh, we will follow two approaches. The first approach will be the data parallel approach that I talked about earlier. So we, in that case, I can use a single pin. Single pin means that uh, all the communication will be in this all reduced case where we take uh, from the various GPUs, we'll take because we have a single model now. So we have to update all simultaneously. So we have to average and therefore we have to do this all reduced operation. Okay, so, so the domain here is a sort of relatively small domain and we separate it into 64 GPUs because I have 64 snapshots uh, in time. Okay, so um, uh, here's some results. Uh, th this is now the correction. Uh, you can think of this as the correction 
uh, or the function of y in, um, in the uh, subgroup stresses versus the distance from the wall. This is a wall, of course, uh, correctly to zero, but we, we um, discover this blue curve here. And we, here we use two different neural networks, two different architectures uh, to see the effect of the architecture. For example, if uh, uh, the standard feed forward neural network would be here on the left. However, if we want to increase the capacity of feed forward neural network, they don't work very well, they don't converge. So we want to uh, we go to ResNets, which are, of course, for different architectures, this would be um, uh, more um, uh, effective. And basically, we can see the same. We, we verify, we discover this behavior very close to the wall. And I have computed here with um, DNS data a priori. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but the reference values show that indeed we um, obtain the correct results. So, 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 so with this uh, 64 um, GPUs, now we are able to recover uh, this uh, correction to the Spangorin CD4. Um, uh, there's some sensitivity of this data to how we balance the data versus the physics. Lambda here would be the Lagrangian multiplier that multiplies the data. So we show that we, if we enforce that uh, in a stronger way, make the value larger, there's some sensitivity to that. Uh, um, and the fields that, uh, so, so as I said earlier, you show, you, uh, you, I show you that with the example of um, uh, conduction in the US map, uh, we compute the inverse problem, something we infer some parameters or the functions, but at the same time we compute the fields. So here uh, we compute uh, the fields. This is predicted from the X pin, uh, and, and from the pin, and this is from the DNS data or the uh, filtered uh, LES data, and the error is of the order of 5% in this case. Same thing for velocities. The velocity V is a little higher, velocity W, and uh, in this in this uh, framework, we can actually compute the pressure uh, without uh, right, uh, without explicitly writing an equation like a Poisson equation for the pressure that is uh, shown here. Uh, within a constant, we can compute the pressure field uh, without solving as a, as a byproduct, in fact, of imposing the Navier Stokes equations in the LES uh, form. Uh, the alternative approach, and, and that's what we are working on currently, we haven't finished this result, is to, to follow the second paradigm approach to where we do this uh, with uh, the X pin, this, uh, as I show here. Again, the communication will be a point to point communication bit to, to, to enforce the uh, zero residual. And we have 64 domain, 64 cubes, and each one of these cubes in time, that is, uh, sits on, on a different uh, uh, GPU. Uh, so the preliminary results are here. You see that some of the, uh, we are, haven't converged fully yet, but we have discovered basically the same, very close to the wall. Um, the solution has discovered, that has been, uh, has converged, and, and, uh, and uh, you see here, uh, there's still some, some uh, tuning to be done to, to get the solution correctly in the bulk of the domain. The wall is here, and the center line is somewhere here. Um, okay, in finishing up, I would like to uh, give some thoughts about machine learning making multi-scale modeling. Uh, in, in some sense, if you can think of this uh, picture and that's a paper we wrote uh, a couple of years ago in, in Nature Digital Medicine uh, for biomedical applications, but it's, uh, the same idea is here. In, in this case of data, theory, uh, ODEs and PDs, we have multi-scale modeling represented here on the right and machine learning uh, here on the left. And as you can see, they, they shake hands here. And the, the reason they shake hands is because they can uh, work synergistically. Uh, of course, with multi-scale modeling, uh, you can predict the system dynamics. You can understand the emergence of functions. You can uh, uh, look at the bridging the scales, identify causality, and so on. On the other hand, machine learning you can explore massive design spaces, identify uh, system dynamics, um, uh, solve ill posed problems. I showed you some ill posed problems uh, here in uh, today uh, because we can solve very good equation without uh, boundary conditions. So, so they do actually work synergistically. So, so this is not that machine learning replaces the multi scale model that, that uh, we were doing uh, before, uh, before scientific machine learning emerged as a uh, new or better discipline. So, uh, and I'd like also to thank my sponsor, the Air Force, for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to work on teams and uh, learning and mental learning. I didn't talk about mental learning, how to use le learning to learn uh, PDEs and uh, hyperparameter um, and also the physics informed learning machines. 
the center of the Baroque energy that I am directing, perhaps seven, the consortium of several universities in Switzerland actually first uh, put together uh, on this field that we started with our collaborators five years ago. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Thank you.